Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, first of all, I've been joining here with my colleague, Council Member Diaz. Uh, welcome to the first hearing of the new section of the City Council Transportation Committee. I'm Danis Rodriguez, and I'm very proud and honored to be returning as a chairman of the committee. Before we proceed, well, I already did, uh, Analyst Council Member Diaz. I'm, an ex I'm excited to build on the many important accomplishments we achieved together over the past four years. From Vision Zero and street safety to making the streets more bike and pedestrian friendly to improving, improving mass transit, serving transit deserts, promoting environmentally friendly and equitable access to transportation regardless of age, disability, or income. There's a lot we have achieved and there's still a lot more to be done. I look forward to working with my colleagues and the speaker at the council to further the many important goals we all have for our vital transportation system and to make New York City a walkable one. Today we will hear an important piece of legislation in 336, which will require DOT to report to the council and to the public regarding enforcement efforts safety and events at Pedestrians Plaza. I would like to thank the OT for accommodating the schedule and be able to be with us with a short period of time. The city now has over 70 plazas throughout the five boroughs, and that number should grow. They are incredible, valuable public spaces. Plaza bring much needed open space for communities that in many cases lack sufficient space for recreation to interact with fellow members of the community, to enjoy the outdoor and to host community events. In 2016, this committee and this council passed Local 53 with the aim of improving the way the city regulates these plazas with a particular focus on making sure they are put to the best possible use. Our plaza should be places where everyone feels welcome and comfortable, and even our, in event, our plaza should be widely appealing and accessible. They should be places where we can put on display the rich cultures in New York City, bring the art to the community, and support our local artists by opening this space for them to exhibit and sell their work. And of course, people should be able to enjoy plazas without worrying about their safety. The plaza which has gotten, gotten the most attention is, of course, Times Square. The crossroads of the world is an iconic in New York landmark. And the pedestrians plaza there has dramatically transformed its capacity to handle the large numbers of people who want to enjoy it every day. Everyone knows that last year we got more than 50 million tourists. Many of them stay around that area. At the same time, that plaza also served the 8.5 million New Yorkers who at one point travel through that area. It is clear that in recent years, Times Square had, in some cases, not been the most pleasant place to be individuals who want to take the opportunity to make some extra money performing in Times Square should have the opportunity to do so while they, they, New Yorkers and visitors, are respectful to one another. In 2016, DOT used the legislation we passed to adopt rules which brought design activity zones and pedestrian flow zones to Times Square in an attempt to bring some order to the plaza and sidewalks and allow everyone who wants to use Times Square for all types of purpose to do so in a more efficient way. We look forward to hearing from DOT today about how those efforts have succeeded so far and what challenges still remain. By requiring reporting about the enforcement of the new plaza rules, the effort the city has made with regard to safety and compliance, and the type of event held at plaza, the goal of intro 
336 is to make sure the goals of both local law 53 and the resulting rules issued by DOT are being met and to identify any changes that may need to be made. At the end of the day, it is all about making sure that our plazas, both in Times Square and those throughout the five worlds are safe and can, and can be freely enjoyed by everyone. With our annual Car Free Day, we aim to achieve just that. This year on April 21st, with the leadership now DOT, we will open a great chunk of Broadway to pedestrians and stem Times Square Plaza down to Union Square. That's gonna be a day opening the street dedicated to pedestrians and cyclists. And everyone is invited to be there as also join us in Washington Heights as we're gonna be opening the street to pedestrians and cyclists at San Nicolas Avenue between 181st and 190. We will be able to move around freely and be greener in honor of Earth Day, which will take place on Sunday, April 22nd, but we're doing the car free day as, a, as we made a commitment with DOT every year, the Saturday before Earth Day. I would like to welcome the representative of DOT who are here with us today. Uh, but before that, I also like to recognize uh, Council Member Ku and Council Member Reynoso. I now ask the committee council to administer the affirmation and then invite DOT to deliver their opening statement. Please raise your right hand. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? May begin. Good afternoon, Chair Rodriguez and members of the Transportation Committee. I am Emily Weidenhoff, Director of the Public Space at New York City DOT, and with me today is Rebecca Zack, Assistant Commissioner for Intergovernmental and Community Affairs. We are here today on behalf of Commissioner Polly Trottenberg to offer testimony on Intro 336. On behalf of DOT, I would like to thank the Council for working to pass Local Law 53 of 2016, authorizing us to develop a regulatory framework for our plaza program. This was an important step forward in our management of the program and has allowed us to establish plaza-specific rules. This year, we celebrate the 10-year anniversary of our plaza program. In that time, we have grown from a patch of paint in Brooklyn to 74 plazas citywide in some phase of design, construction, or completion, with almost 60 of these currently open to the public. This includes our new 185th Street Plaza, the second permanent plaza we've opened with Chair Rodriguez in his district. Plazas create a safer, more walkable neighborhoods while providing vital gathering space for communities. And with the 1NYC Plaza Equity Program, we are truly taking our program to the next level. Thanks to this initiative, we provide vital maintenance and technical assistance to 30 of our most high-need plaza partners. These are the organizations that are responsible for maintenance and programming under an agreement with DOT to deliver quality public space citywide, despite varying organizational capacity in different neighborhoods. Regarding the bill before us today, intro 336 would require DOT to annually submit to City Council and post on our website a report on one, the number of summonses issued for violations of pedestrian plaza rules by plaza and offense, two, any measures taken to promote safety and compliance with any such pedestrian plaza rules in each pedestrian plaza, and three, a list of events held in each plaza. When it comes to reporting summonses for violations of plaza rules, DOT does not issue such summonses, nor do we record or compile such information. Our NYPD colleagues enforce plaza rules and issue summonses, and therefore we defer to them on the requirement of this bill. Similarly, when it comes to events on plazas, the Street Activity Permit Office, or SAPO, located within the Mayor's Office of Citywide Event Coordination and Management, is responsible for issuing and tracking permits for such events, 
and therefore we defer to them on the specifics of that information. The Mayor's Office of Media and Entertainment is also responsible for issuing some permits for events and plazas, and we defer to them regarding information on those events. Both NYPD and SAPO have indicated that the majority of this type of data is already required to be made public under either open data law or existing reporting requirements. Regarding the remaining reporting requirement of the bill, DOT takes a range of measures to promote safety as well as compliance with our plaza rules. To separate pedestrians in our plazas and on our sidewalks generally from vehicular traffic, we use a variety of treatments to both delineate and provide a physical barrier based on the needs and the space available. These include our curbs, street trees, landscaping features, flexible delineators, planters, and granite blocks. Permanently reconstructed plazas also include enhanced pedestrian lighting to increase safety and quality of life. As you know, the city has also embarked on a new program of installing pedestrian security measures, including bollards and other measures, at locations identified in partnership with the NYPD. Local Law 80 of 2018, sponsored by Chair Rodriguez, mandates, among other things, that DOT report annually on the number of bollards we install within our right-of-way and the number of locations where they are installed. When it comes to compliance with our plaza rules, DOT plays a role in addition to NYPD's enforcement efforts. We are currently updating plaza signage to make reference to some of the new pedestrian plaza rules. The content of these signs is based on input from both NYPD and our pedestrian plaza partners about what rules would be most helpful to list based on their knowledge of common issues. We also consider various design features to ensure compliance with our plaza rules. For example, armrests on benches deter skateboarding. In addition, our pedestrian plaza partners constantly monitor conditions on the ground and report issues to us as they arise. DOT then works with them to craft customized solutions to plaza-specific issues. For example, at one particular plaza location, our partner identified smoking in violation of plaza rules as a quality of life issue, and we worked with them to install additional no smoking signage placed in key locations. One of the best known examples of when DOT worked with the NYPD and a pedestrian plaza partner to address a particular issue is in Times Square, there, we installed designated activity zones, or DAZs, and pedestrian flow zones to safely and efficiently manage one of the world's most visited spaces. The goal is to provide ample space for commercial activities without impeding those passing through or who simply wish not to participate in such activities. As you can see, DOT undertakes a broad range of measures to maintain safety and quality of life in pedestrian plazas. We appreciate the Council's interest in our pedestrian plaza efforts, on which we partner closely with NYPD and pedestrian plaza partners. Should the Council choose to advance this legislation, we would request the opportunity to work with you on amendments to reflect the types of measures taken that are suitable and possible to include in an annual report, and avoid requirements that are duplicative or require information that may already be publicly available. Thank you for the opportunity to offer testimony. I can now answer questions about Intro 336. Thank you. Uh, I have a few questions first, and on that my colleague, they also, so my colleague, they also had to lead to another hearing, so I will be sure that I will call them before uh, the time that they had to leave. I also would like to acknowledge that here we have Council Member Dodge, Levine, and Miller. I, I believe that the fact that we don't have a centralized system to collect and report those data is one why we want to establish this new reporting law. Of, and I don't want to put you in the spot. What I can say is I just hope that we can continue the conversation. Uh, I don't know if the position is. No, we feel that based on what the other agency they say that this is not something that we should establish or the approach should be 
we just had to talk to the other agencies and here continue the conversation with us. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chairman. Yeah, we're happy to continue those discussions and work on you with amendments with NYPD okay. and to get to a place I think we'll all be happy. Okay, because that's exactly, you know, we, I, I, I see the merit of why if we have 70 plaza, and of course, if you ask me, my goal should be to double those numbers. Uh, New York City should not be behind other cities being the most walkable one. And I know that at the beginning with the, the ideas of the plaza was to create those plaza where there was no close to park, it was creating those opportunities for pedestrians. I, I think that today, what we have seen in the plaza is we've been experiencing more cultural events and activities in certain plaza compared to others. And when we were here, and the process is going through the evolution. I'm not saying that, you know, this is all we can do. This is all we can deliver. Uh, what we want, and it's my intention of getting the reporting, especially in the cultural piece, what percentage, how many years, how many days a year are a plaza used for cultural events? Okay. I don't know if this is something that... That's I, I know that's something I think our SAPO partners can answer, and we can work with them to get you that information. Okay. This is a one, one aspect that we address about a plaza, especially when we discuss the Disney character at Times Square, and we were able to move into pass the legislation, but we asked for a compromise where we asked and they were here, all those Disney community, they were here, and the theater coalition, they were here, saying that if we would work together on passing, putting those restrictions where the, those Disney characters were walking in Times Square, that they will be working to establish partnership with all the other all the, all the plaza in underserved community to bring cultural events. Have we, have you been able to see that commitment that they made here, that they happening? So we have seen some, um, some coordination between different groups and, and cultural events. Definitely not um, uh, program wide. Okay, so that's what I'm pushing for. I am pushing to see, I know the value of whatever we do or we do around Times Square especially to Disney and the whole corporation there. And as I know the value, I suspect also that, and I'm not saying that they are not doing it. I just bring it to the attention that I just hope to see, get a report on how much are those theater community around Times Square also establishing partnership with all the plaza that they don't have the same attention and resources that they want in Times Square. Uh, Councilmember Dutch, he has a question. I know he has to look to chair another hearing. Yeah, thank you. Um, so on this reporting bill, so this would require, I guess, would it be DOT or uh, NYPD to report um, the number of violations that occur on plaza, on plazas. So how would how would you um, determine how would that work? You mean how? who would compile the violations? Yeah. The NYPD. The NYPD, and so the NYPD would then report it to the council, in other words, right? I'm actually, yeah. I mean, I think that's a, a detail left to be determined. The most efficient way for NYPD to, to report their data and through who. So how would DOT collaborate with the NYPD in regards to um, ensuring that our plazas remain safe and getting these numbers as well and determining and seeing what needs to be done in the future to maybe change some design of the plazas. For example, um, one particular thing is like, we don't know how many 311 calls that are called in regards to plazas when there's a homeless uh, person sleeping on a plaza, right? So how would that work? So I think there are um, a couple different points to your question. Overall, in terms of coordinating NYPD data and aggregating that and reporting it um, plaza 
by plaza. That's a detail we would need to figure out and work with NYPD to, um, to try to make that as uh, kind of streamlined as possible. When it comes to the safety in all of our plazas that are um, open to the public now, we work very closely with our pedestrian plaza partners as well as the local precincts. So as issues arise, um, you know, we really work on a plaza by plaza basis to, um, to solve issues in each community. So um, I believe the, the, pedest the plazas were firstly, were first initiated with the previous administration, right, under Mike Bloomberg. So what kind of changes have you seen uh, since the plazas were implemented up until now? Uh, what changes has DOT made um, in, in response to the collaboration with the Department of Homeless Services, with the NYPD? That's a fantastic question. Um, largely when uh, the Plaza program started, we had partners coming to us who um, had a lot of uh, institutional capacity. So we saw large business improvement districts, um, Plaza partners in Manhattan, in the, the core of downtown Brooklyn. Over time, more community groups have come to us um, in, in other parts of the city, and um, we are very excited that through our 1NYC Plaza Equity Program, we can now accept partners who lack some of the uh, institutional capacity. Uh, we can accept them into our program and offer, um, through our partnership with the Neighborhood Plaza Program, offer them technical assistance and maintenance to ensure that that we have high quality public spaces all throughout the city. And I would say that's one of the, the biggest defining um, uh, evolution uh, that the program has taken over the years. So would you say that there were many changes that have been made since, uh, since it was implemented? Like for example, you know, when you put out benches to have the benches with multiple dividers so no one could actually sleep there overnight. Have you? I mean, were there like many changes since it was first implemented, would you say? So from the uh, beginning... I'm, I'm, talk, I'm, I'm talking about the design of the plaza. So with each individual space, uh, we often uh, implement them first in interim materials, and then we watch the spaces, see how they're being used, see what issues arise, and that gives us the opportunity to um, enhance the design when we make them permanent. Uh, but from the beginning, we knew that there would be a whole host of, of issues with having a space in the public realm. And so we always looked to design, um, design elements in the plaza to ensure uh, safety and ensure that the plazas would be able to be used by all, um, all New Yorkers. Can you, can you give me like one or two examples of what type of changes were made? Sure, well, specifically from a programmatic level, um, we used to just install uh, our interim materials, and then that's the gravel and planters that we can put down quickly, uh, and then we would move to the permanent redesign where we fully reconstruct the street, bring the plaza up to grade, um, but we heard from a lot of communities that even to get to that interim stage, there were a lot of questions and concerns. So we developed the one-day plaza program, which allowed us to have an even lighter and quicker test of whether a space would be successful or not. So we work with community groups to close um, a street to vehicles and open it to pedestrians for just a day or two uh, to give the neighborhood a sense of what, uh, um, what benefits a plaza could bring to their community. And what changes have you made to, um, to address like the quality of life issues that may have been uh, brought to your attention? So, um, you know, in certain circumstances, again, um, particular plazas will receive a lot of complaints about skateboarding. So sometimes we'll add additional measures um, to seating to ensure that, that folks can't um, damage, um, whether it be granite blocks or benches things like that, um, but largely um, a, huge, a huge transformation in how, um, how our spaces are managed, uh, we owe to our pedestrian plaza rules and, and the legislation by council. That's given us a set of tools that's able to manage these spaces for the way they're being used as public spaces. 
How many, uh, how many pedestrian plazas do you have across the city? So we have 74 total. Total. How many from these 74 have actual bollards surrounding the pedestrian plazas? Um, I can't, I don't have that, that specific number. Would you say all, they all have? No. Is that part of your future plan to install them? Is it, was it a recommendation from DOT to ensure that people in there remain safe in case anything, anyone does want to uh, um, drive through with a vehicle? So um, we, um, our engineers design our plazas to make sure that they are safe in a normal uh, traffic environment, but we also work, also work very closely with NYPD uh, and their, their counterterrorism division to, um, uh, to, to design uh, additional safety measures um, for, um, for situations where there's intent involving a vehicle. So what do you call intent? I mean, any open space is a target. PD, PD um, yeah, is, is best to answer that. Um, they, they offer a, um, a whole range of different factors that goes into their determinations. So from these 74, you're saying the ones that don't have ballots, they did not, uh, a request was, or a study was not made by the NYPD, or it was made and they determined that it's not necessary? I'd, I'd say that I, I think that if you're, there's a particular location that you're concerned about, we could follow up with you. I don't know if we have the exact information on 74 plazas to give you on why or why not uh, some measures might not be there or are there, but we're happy to follow up with you. Okay, thank you. And I just want to commend Rebecca for the great work she does all year round. Thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Thank you. We've also been joined by Council Member Reacher. Uh, how do you describe Times Square Plaza today? In which area do you think that that plaza can be improved? That's a great question. Um, we are certainly, um, as, it, as it relates to our pedestrian plaza rules, and specifically the DAZs and pedestrian flow zones, um, as you know, that these were measures that we implemented in temporary materials, in markings and paint, uh, because um, these were new, new regulatory layers, and so we knew there would be um, a certain amount of adjustment and um, kind of evolution of, of these spaces. So we are actively um, uh, uh, studying uh, the effectiveness of, of these, and we will be reporting back on those. Um, something that we acknowledge uh, in terms of improvements uh, to the Times Square plazas in the future is that we built out the, the main bow tie. So we made the plazas from 42nd Street to 47th Street permanent, but there's still a tail to the north. The Times Square plaza actually starts at 41st Street and goes all the way up to 53rd Street. And so we are in um, active conversations with the Times Square Alliance about how we um, improve uh, the remainder of the spaces that are still in the old uh, temporary paint and markings and how we bring um, uh, more pedestrian amenities to those spaces because there are certainly more people coming to Times Square um, and those spaces could definitely be enhanced. Great. How do you review the use of plazas? Do you have like a, every two, three years? What are the, me what I, what are the measures that, that you use to put together a report? That's a great question. So we have, um, uh, every year, uh, for the past few years, we take a subset of our plazas and we do uh, a user analysis. So we look at who's using the spaces, what types of activities are in the spaces, um, how clean are, are the spaces, uh, and that's something we look to get a general, um, a general assessment of how our different types of spaces are doing. But also as part of our One NYC Plaza Equity Program, each of these partners is receiving a more detailed assessment, um, and we're watching um, how the spaces are changing with these services, as well as how the partners are evolving over time. So that gives us another layer um, of information to see what's working, what's not, so we can um, help improve uh, conditions for both the spaces and our partners. When a not-for-profit 
submit the application and get approved by DOT to operate the plaza. Uh, it's like uh, for a period of time, is that permanent? How does it work? Um, so you're asking how, so once a partner applies and is accepted, mm -hmm. how? So we, um, like I mentioned before, we have a, a competitive program uh, where partners apply to us. Once a partner is actually accepted into the program, then we work with the community to develop a, a design for the space, and we go um, to the community board and have them review the proposal, um, at which point, uh, once we um, have kind of all agreed upon a design, then we work with the pedestrian plaza partner on a legal agreement um, for the maintenance of that space. Um, and from that point, then we would uh, implement the plaza, whether it be in our interim materials or um, a permanent design of the space. So I assume that the lawyers from both sides, they talk about what are those agreements, and there's like the DOT like regularly review those agreements, and, and in that's the case like every five years, every 10 years, like you know how often does DOT review the functioning of those plaza that already exist. Uh, so it is um, a DOT legal do, uh, is involved in all of our Plaza partner agreements. Um, each of those agreements have different terms depending on what type of agreement it is. Um, but with some of our um, uh, agreements, particularly uh, license agreements for concessions, uh, those agreements come with reporting requirements. So our partners are reporting back to DOT um, their maintenance costs over the year, um, any uh, revenue that they are, are bringing in, which then they use for the maintenance and programming of the plaza. So DOT is seeing and reviewing those numbers on an annual basis. Okay, and, and, and when a proposal for the plaza go in front of you, those community board, is the community board role to give recommendation or is like does community board put a stop on any proposal? Um, the community board is very important in our process and we go to them for all of our plaza proposals. Okay. Council member, any more question? Or? No. Okay. Richard, you see this probably today was like the shortest uh, <laughs> time for you to testify. But I appreciate again that you came. Uh, I know it was a short notice. Uh, we had to make some changes uh, at the initial hearing for this topic, uh, topic for this hearing. And uh, we will have our uh, uh, budget hearing on March 8th, uh, where we expected to see a high rank from the, from the MTA to us, DOT will be here to come and testify in transportation. We're looking so, forward to it. Thank you, Mr. Yeah. Chairman. Thank you, and I know that we're working together for the car free day. Yeah, can't Thank wait. You. Thank you. Thanks. Here now we have Sam Sham Asinski. And, and if you don't mind, uh, I'm sorry that, if you don't mind, just one last question, because I know that Sam is gonna be working on a topic that is also important for me. We have a motto on, in Washington Heights, we have Plaza Las America that was created and, and I don't know if there's any other plaza where uh, most of the use, the plaza is used most time during, during the week to allow also a street vendors to be there. Is there any other model, is there any other plaza where also uh, from the moment that being created also work with a street vendor to be able that in an organized, coordinated by the non-for-profit to be able to have the opportunity to sell the products in those plazas? So men, the majority of our plazas are in commercial districts and so have um, a lot of commercial activity in them. Um, Plaza de las Americas is certainly unique, but there are a few other cases, um, uh, for example, Forsyth, Plaza in Chinatown, where there were existing, there was an existing market, and so we're working very closely with our pedestrian plaza partner um, to uh, keep a lot of that that same um, commercial activity uh, in in the plaza once it's done 
with construction. Um, you know, we think it's incredibly important to be able to sit in a plaza and get a cup of coffee or buy some fruit. And so um, we work with each individual plaza partner in the community to kind of tailor the right balance of, of commercial activity um, in, in the plaza space. Okay, and it, as I say, a private, I want to say public, I hope that we can continue working also on creating the 168 in Haven Plaza that I hope will allow to create a good place for pedestrians to walk there and also for local artists to be able to exhibit in that part of the honor of Manhattan. We look forward to working with you. Thank you. Thank Thanks. You. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, Chair uh, Rodriguez. I just walked in, and so I didn't, I didn't get a chance to listen to all the testimony, but um, and I, I'm surprised I'm the only one up here, but I, I'm, I appreciate the chance to testify today. I just, I just heard about this hearing from an email that you sent, I think, on Friday or Saturday, um, so I didn't know about it, but street vendors care very much about the issues of public plazas, and thank you for asking that question to DOT. It's funny, I just came back from a big conference on cities that happened uh, two weeks ago in Kuala Lumpur about, about the equitable use of cities, or creating fair cities. And uh, one, at least one of the, the uh, <coughs> topics, the, the panels, was on the equitable use of public space. And what we've seen in New York City, uh, from our perspective, from the public plaza uh, program, is, is an unfair or unequitable use of public space. What happens is plazas are created, which is a great thing, right? Uh, the, uh, the excuse that's always given about vendors is there's no room for vendors, so it's a great thing to be creating more space for people, uh, vendors, and others. But what we've seen time and time again is when the plazas are created, then vendors who have been working there get evicted. This is not legal uh, entirely. It's not clear, uh, or it seems to be uh, illegal, actually. But the reason this happens, I think you might know, uh, uh, Chair Rodriguez and the other council members, is, is because invariably the uh, control of that public space, that public plaza, is given over to a bid. And, and bids are, are not crazy about having vendors, or they might like vendors to be there, but they want to uh, auction off that space. They want to make money from that vending space and not allow a vendor who's otherwise licensed and permitted by the city to be able to sell there. So we've seen this time and time again. So, um, uh, so we therefore support uh, uh, any efforts, as I understand them, to get more information from the city on the public plaza program, how it's being used, who's benefiting, and who's being excluded from those public spaces. Uh, typically not just vendors, but homeless people, uh, skateboarders, and, and other undesirables are not allowed to be in these nice public plazas that are created. And we've seen that here in New York City. And we like, um, uh, uh, perhaps there's, uh, additionally, we've seen that the public plazas are often used by the bids for big events where they make money, uh, thereby excluding uh, others from that space. And so I would just, uh, one suggestion for an improvement to the legislation would be that the uh, city be required to report on the events and how much those events take in from oftentimes the corporate sponsors that are allowed, again, to use those public spaces when we as a small nonprofit, when uh, Muhammad or Maria who just want to make a, a, a livelihood in the public space invariably are not allowed to be there. Uh, so thank you very much. I look forward to hearing more and speaking with you separately and the committee. I appreciate the time. Thank you. So with that, this hearing is adjourned. I'm sorry. Uh, Council, I want to acknowledge also Councilman Cabrera was here, but it is adjourned. <laughs>